I firmly believe that good relations between peoples and religions are vital in order to foster the growth and advancement of the human race. And I hope that this visit of mine will foster mutual knowledge and understanding between the Holy See and the state of Kuwait. These two states have enjoyed good diplomatic relations for many years now since 1968. I have been working at the Vatican secret archives for 15 years and I'm truly passionate about my job, which is to help and advise the scholars and researchers who come from all over the world. On average, we get over 60 visitors per day, and I am delighted to be one of the people who are available to offer support. This may regarding a particular historical period or a specific document. I often keep in touch with the scholars I meet. With some, I have established a lasting and rewarding friendship. The archives contain the writings of the popes, especially those who lived in the second millennium of the common era, as well as many other documents belonging to the Catholic Church. Of course, many smaller churches scattered throughout the world have their own archives with documents that concern their particular history. But those I will speak in to you about are especially valuable because they concern the supreme authority within the Catholic Church and the contacts that the popes had with kings, emperors, and religious leaders from all over the world. With regards to this, I would like to share with you the suggestion made by a much-loved French historian called Marc Bloch. He said that a scholar of ancient documents needs to be able to sense the real presence of the people who produce them. He or she should almost smell the scent of those men and women who lived such a long time ago. Sometimes we have very little left from the people of the past, and I always find it a deeply moving experience when I am able to hold in my hands an object or a piece of writing that they produce. To give you an example, I will tell you that some years ago I was in Paris researching and organizing the documents belonging to the Pope's ambassadors to that city in the 1930s. While looking through the papers, I found a bill that was brought to the ambassador palace for a delivery of coal. Paris is very cold during the winter. On that bill, I could see the fingerprints of the worker who had delivered the coal to the ambassador palace. Almost certainly a poor and illiterate man who would not have been able to write the bill himself. But he left his coal stained fingerprints on that paper and then was holding it in front of me, in front of my own eyes. It was an amazing experience, as nothing else could possibly be left of that man. Coming back to the documents preserved in the archives, the oldest are dated between the 8th and the 9th century of the common era, and they testified 
to the contacts that the Church of Rome had with the entire world. There are over 650 different archival sources on different topics, and if you were to put them in a strange line, the total length would be about 85 kilometers. The documents range from whole pieces of parchment on which a pope made a special concession to a king or a monastery, for example, by permitting them to use a building that belonged to the church, to letters that various individuals sent to the pope in Rome. Such letters did not just come from powerful people, such as emperors or kings, but also from ambassadors, monks, businessmen, and ordinary believers. We have letters from popes who were held prisoners by Napoleon in the first decade of the 19th century, and notes from wives, mothers, sons, and daughters of people who were displaced during the two world wars, who were pleading for the Pope's help to locate them. The more ancient documents are available to be viewed, while some of the more recent ones are not yet open to scrutiny, as only recently have they been filed and put in their set places. I will be showing you a video that was made for the occasion of the 400th anniversary of the establishment of the archives, which took place in the 2012. I hope that you will find it interesting and helpful. I am delighted to be your guide in the discovery of this fascinating and at times mysterious archives. A place of mystery and fascination. Twelve centuries of history preserved for 400 years. Conclaves, heresies, popes and emperors, crusades and excommunications, ciphered letters, manuscripts and codices coming from five continents. 650 archival fonds, 30,000 parchments, 85 linear kilometers of shelves and millions of documents. This is the Central Archive of the Holy See, the Vatican Secret Archives. The air of mystery created by the name alone has always provoked curiosity and encouraged imaginative speculation. The archives lies inside Vatican City, occupying a vast area of the Apostolic Palace, extending along the northwest side of the Belvedere Courtyard and along the Pius IV Wing that looks out onto the Vatican Gardens on one side and onto the Library Courtyard on the other. A place that testifies to the centuries-old role of the church as custodian of historical memory. Its name comes from the Latin word secretum, 
meaning separate or private, not open to everyone, but reserved for the use of the Supreme Pontiff and his collaborators. The Vatican Secret Archives was created to be the Pope's archives. The Pope exercises supreme and exclusive jurisdiction over the archives through the Cardinal Archivist, while everyday operations are the responsibility of the Prefect. There are over 600 fonds preserved in the Vatican secret archives, 1,200 years of history from the 8th to the 20th century, extending over 85 linear kilometers of shelves, the equivalent to the length of the Panama Canal. Pope Paul V began the archives in 1612 with the idea of uniting in a single place the documents that were then distributed in various locations, from the Vatican Library to the archive of the Apostolic Chamber, and some even in the Castel Sant'Angelo. This allowed easier access to documents that were necessary for the temporal and spiritual governance of the Church, and guaranteed their preservation over time. Between 1611 and 1614, three rooms on the second floor were made available to house this new collection. The Mercury and Pegasus Room, the Room of the Musician Angels, and that of the Triumph of Paul V, complete with poplar and walnut wood cupboards decorated with the heraldic devices of the Borghese family. Frescoes adorning the walls depict sovereigns of the principal European dynasties, handing over their dominions to different popes. Among them, Otto I consigning the famous Privilegium to Pope John the Twelfth, or Frederick II, swearing an oath of loyalty to Honorius III and the Apostolic See. The documentary heritage has never stopped growing, along with the need to create new spaces to house the vast and increasing collection. In 1660, Pope Alexander VII Kiji enlarged the rooms housing the archives to include those above the Piano Nobile on the second floor and beside the tapestry gallery of the Vatican Museums. These are the Kiji rooms, the oldest nucleus of the Secretary of State Archives. This is the location of the so-called Room of Michelania, which was arranged at the beginning of the 18th century under Clement XI with 15 wall cupboards containing various documents, including the Liber Diurnus Romanorum Pontificum, the oldest formulary of the Pontifical Chancellery, dating back to the 8th and 9th centuries, and the volume containing the controversial trial of Galileo. Around the end of the 18th century, when Rome was occupied by French and Neapolitan troops, the documents remaining in Castel Sant'Angelo were transferred to the archive. In a single day, in the summer of 1798, the prefect, Gaetano Marini, completed the operation using the secret passageway, or passetto, that links the castle with the Vatican. Unfortunately, Nothing could stop another, more tragic transfer a few years later. In 1810, Napoleon ordered that the entire papal archives be brought to Paris. It was only between 1815 and 1817 that the surviving documents were returned to Rome. Many had been damaged and several had been lost. In 1881, Pope Leo XIII made the historic decision to open the doors of the papal archives to scholars of all nations and religions. 
Since then, access to the Vatican secret archives has been free of charge and open to qualified researchers engaged in historical studies. Presently, the Vatican secret archives welcomes over 1,200 scholars from around 60 countries every year. The continual transfer of documentation from the various dicasteries of the Roman Curia during the 20th century meant that more suitable storage space had to be found. A two-story reinforced concrete bunker was built beneath the courtyard of the pine cone in the Vatican museums. It was begun under the pontificate of Paul VI and inaugurated by John Paul II in 1980. It constitutes the largest storage area of the archives, extending 31,000 cubic meters with 43,000 linear meters of shelving. Another area called Sofitoni was created by Pope Pius XII in 1950 above the Gallery of the Maps in the Vatican Museums. Another 13,000 linear meters of metal shelving called Scaffali and Ferro are distributed over two floors and run parallel to the Belvedere courtyard. The new locations also include two rooms where the temperature and relative humidity is kept constant. This is where the oldest and most valuable parchment items are kept, some of them complete with gold seals. New areas have also been created for scholars. Researchers have four reading rooms at their disposal all complete with connections for their personal computers. The Leo XIII's index room is the point of departure for researchers. This is where they can consult the Schedario Garampi, the first research instrument perfected by the Vatican Secret Archives when it opened to the public in 1881 and made available to scholars in the early 20th century. 125 volumes divided on the basis of the subjects contained in the roughly 800,000 written cards compiled under the direction of Giuseppe Garampi, who was prefect of the archives between 1751 and 1772. The Pius XI document reading room where original documents can be requested and consulted. Bundles, registers, boxes and parchments are distributed by reading room staff to scholars who then face the challenging task of deciphering often not easily readable handwriting. Finally, the Sixtus V rooms, two areas for consulting archival indexes, the many collections of historical works, and for viewing digital reproductions of documents. The Vatican Secret Archives is a physical place, and as such is subject to the changes of time and the needs of the moment. But it's also a symbolic place in terms of what it is and what it does. I have given you an overview of the main documents contained in the Vatican archives. I hope that this will have stimulated your curiosity and desire to know more. I shall now proceed to show you a number of slides representing some documents that come from all the five continents and that bear witness to centuries of contacts between the Holy See and people all over the world. The first, the Caliph and the Pope. 
a letter from Abu Afs Umar al Murtada to Innocent III, June the 10th, 1250. Pope Honorius III was able to found Morocco first diocese at Fes, and Caliph al Murtada, who had been in power for only two years, gave to the Catholic bishops Lopez Fernandez de Ain a letter to deliver to the Pope, whom the Caliph defined as the unchallenged sovereign of the kings of Christendom, venerated by the princes of the Roman nation, head of the Christian people, heir to the religious supremacy. Later on, contacts between the papal court in Rome and the Kingdom of Morocco began to decrease and they eventually ceased altogether. 600 years were to pass before Sultan Hassan I dispatched a special embassy to Leo XIII in 1888 on the occasion of the Pope's Jubilee. Second one, the last Ming Empress. A letter to Innocent X written on silk by Elena of China, November the 1st, 1650. In early April 1648, a Jesuit father named Andreas Wolfgang Koffler went over to the Roman Catholic faith a number of authoritative members of the Ming court. The Empress Elena, having learned that the Manchus were against Ming, wrote to the Pope Innocent X on November the 4th, 1650. In her letter, she professed her Catholic faith and asked the Pope to pray to God for the Mings to win against the Manchus and upon the conversion of the Emperor Yongli. The letter was written on a long length of silk that was carefully rolled up and placed in a bamboo tube decorated with the imperial dragon symbol. Third, Abraham Lincoln accredits his ambassador to the papal court. This is a letter from the President of the United States to Pius IX, November 16, 8, 1863. On November 16, 1863, as the American Civil War was raging, Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of the United States, wrote a letter to the Pope accredited Rufus King as the country's new residence ambassador to the Holy See. The United States government's representatives continued their diplomatic work, but it soon came to the end. In 1876, 67, sorry, relations between the United States and the Papal States were broken off after rumors spread in the North charging alleged Catholic Papist complicity in Lincoln's assassination. After this unfortunate misunderstanding, the Holy See had to wait more than 70 years before another U.S. diplomat was appointed to represent this country at the Vatican. Fourth, the oldest paper document written in Mongolian, Sev Kandat, signed by Abba, Ilkhan of Persia, to protect the Papal Ambassador, November the 21st, 12, 79. Free paper document issued by the Chancery of the Ilkhans of Persia 
and datable from 1279 to 1302, were discovered in the Vatican secret archives in the early decades of the 20th century. They are still considered the oldest known text on paper written in Uyghur script. One of them is a safe conduct or pass, enabling a Christian embassy to travel safely back to the West. It was issued by Abaka, the ruler of Persia, and addressed to a commander named Samagar. Fifth, the Pope and the Incas. It's a brief from Clement VIII written in the Quechua language, June the 30th, 1603. This is the only papal brief we know of that was written in Quechua language. It was written in 1603, and in it, Clement VIII officially recognized a confraternity called the Nombre de Jesus, the name of Jesus. The association had been founded 20 years earlier in the Peruvian city of Cusco as a result of the missionary work in which a number of Jesuit fathers, including the Mestizo Blas Valera, had engaged since the late 16th century. Thanks to Valera's intercultural mediation, most of the descendants of the Inca nobility had converted to the Catholic religion and joined the confraternity. Sixth, the Tsar of Russia against the Sultan. A letter from Alexei I Romanov to Clement X, October the 21st, 1672. In attempt to stem the Turkish tide, which threatened the Russian Empire's southern border, Tsar Alexei turned to many of Europe's sovereigns, including the King of Poland, proposing to create a broad anti-Turkish alliance. Also, he wrote to Pope Clement X, asking him to back to the common cause with the weight of his religious authority. The margins of the letter he delivered to the Curia, which described Alexei's project, are decorated with the gold leaf frame and frolal motifs. Seventh, a birch bark message to the great master of prayer. A letter from the Ojibwe native of Canada to Leo the 13th, May the 21st, 1887. The evangelization undertaken in North America in the 17th century by Jesuit missionaries promoted the establishment of small Christian communities among the native populations. In 1887, the Christian community of the Chippewa of Grassy Lake, Canada, and its leader, Pierre Pilsemont, had written to Pope Leo XIII in their letter written on birch bark, they addressed the Pope in the typical phrases of Ojibwe culture as the great master of prayer, he who acts in Jesus' stead. Chief Pilsemon thanked God and the Pope for having sent to this land a guardian of prayer, Narcisse Zephyrine Lorraine, who has had recently been appointed Vicar Apostolic of Pontiac in Canada. Eighth, congratulations from Hirohito. A letter from the Emperor of Japan to Pope Pius XII, 
June the 7th, 1939. The long reign of Emperor Hirohito spanned a large part of the 20th century and witnessed epochal changes in the history of Japan. Hirohito was the first Japanese sovereign to have regular relations with the Holy See, where Japan's first permanent envoy was accredited in 1942. The letter that Hirohito wrote to Pius XII upon his election to the papal throne was accompanied by a French translation and placed in an envelope under a paper seal depicting the 16 petal chrysanthemum emblem of the imperial house. And knife, last but not least, a collection of Persian poems. Poems of Muta Shami Kajani, 1582. The Chaldean patriarchs, Monsignor Suleiman Sayek, offered to Pope John XXIII in 1960 a precious gift, a Persian language manuscript containing a selection of short lyrical poems of the kind called Ghazaliyat, written in the second half of the 16th century by Muatashami Kajani, core poem of the Shah of the Safavid dynasty. The poems were transcribed in the elegant Nastalik script on loose sheets glued in two rectangular slots, cut into the individual pages of the codex. The poet had concluded his collection at the beginning of the blessed month of Ramadan 990, that is September the 19th, 1582. The book has all the features of Deluxe Codex. So thank you very much for listening. I will look forward to meeting you in the Vatican, where I will be delighted to lead you on a proper and exciting visit.